We are go. Like, what does that mean? Come with me on a journey. It's evening. The hall is dark, lit only by the rush light and the great hearth. The people have feasted well. The mead has gone around. Story, stories have been told, songs sung. And now a poet stands by the high table and whispers right through the crowd. But here's Wolfstan, son of Raven, come from the north, where he has been scald to seven princes before. And others say, and now he is courtier to the great Baron William Lionsgate. And still others know more of him, that he is student to the great poet Shannon Lee Laferty, worthy of fame. And as the crowd whispers amongst themselves, the smoke rises up from the hearth, and serpents of smoke dance among the rafters like the arm of some great beast. The poet takes up the harp and calls attention to the people. Quiet! We are Dana and Yardem. Thio the king, Thrim your friend, Heath Ethelingas, Erin Fremadon. Oh, she'll shaping, shaping a fretting, morning a metal. Mere settler of tear, eggs of the airless, sitting airless where. The hash of Flinden, Wilkes and their Wolfman, where it mended the bar. There it was sitting there over Hanrad, here in Shoulder, Yomben Gilden. <laughs> that was God Keening. The Mayfra was after Kenneth, Young and Yardum. Don God send. Hope to Frafra. Fear and there on yet, but he er drug and alderlis long wheel. He in the slavefria, wolders wailed him, world are for ye. Beowulf was brave, blade the weed it sprang, shield the zephra, shed a land of him. So I shall young you, my god, that you are then, from whom fell gift him in father berm. <coughs> But he in elder, if you win again, will ye set us? Don we come. Leoda, you lies them. Left item shall in Matthew of our mania theon. In his time, she'll departed, went into the keeping of his lord. The people in sorrow laid their master in a ship hard by the mast, and piled it high with treasures, with gold rings. Coats of mail, fine swords, and bore hel proud helms. <clears throat> and so, in their sorrowing, sent him off to see whence he had come. No one, nor mighty man of arms, nor wise counselor in hall, can say for certain who unshipped that cargo or where he made his landfall. After Shield Biao, his son, became king, ruled wisely and well for many years, and in time, came his son, Hrothgar, to the throne. Now, Hrothgar was a great and mighty king, the greatest king ever to be known until the kings of Antir arose. <clears throat> and few people have known such mighty heroes as their kings as Hrothgar, or Savarik, or Stierkar. And as a great king, he had a great following, a great host of men, and those who lived with him and <clears throat> supported them. And for his great host, he thought, I must have a great hall to feast them and give rings, as the Lord should do. And so he ordered Herot built, wide gabled, high rafter with horns spreading into the sky. And for many years, <clears throat> His hall was a place of mirth and mead and story and song. And people came from all across the northern lands to celebrate in Hrothgar's court. But there was one 
an outcast. Grendel by name, of the kindred of Cain, the race of all monsters. He heard the stories and heard the songs, heard men making merry with their mead, and he became jealous. And it came to his heart to destroy Hrothgar and his hall. Not in one fell swoop, but in pieces. For to destroy a lord, you destroy his people. So Grendel came to the hall. From the mirror where he lived, approaching the gate. And when he got there, devoured all that he could find. For twelve winters this continued, and Grendel would come nightly to the hall, and any he found inside, he would tear to pieces and devour. Hrothgar's folk abandoned the hall. By day he could hold his court there, but by night none would sleep within its walls. And as Hrothgar's reputation and his host diminished, so his despair grew. A hero of the northern lands, Beowulf, son of Ecgtheow, a famed Higelac, king of the wind-loving Geats, heard of his kinsman Hrothgar's plight. He consulted with the Witan, took counsel, and gathered to him a fellowship of fourteen men, had a ship fitted, and sailed for the Danish coast to save Hrothgar and his people from their dire distress. After two days, they reached the headland, were challenged, making landfall by the Danish coast guard, and when they had told him their names, their country, their kinship, and their quest, were conveyed to Hrothgar's hall. And there, the men stacked their spears, took off their high, proud helms, shrugged their shoulders in heavy mail, set their shields against the wall, and gratefully sat down upon a bench to await the king's pleasure. When Hrothgar received them, <clears throat> he thanked them for coming, accepted them gladly, and Beowulf made him this vow, that as Grendel disdained the use of any weapons, so Beowulf too would fight with his bare hands, and God may dispose who would be the winner. But come what may, by morning, either Grendel or Beowulf himself would be no more. The people celebrated into the evening, but as the sun began to set, Hrothgar's folk grew nervous, started trickling away from the hall, for they knew what was coming. Soon, only the fifteen Geats remained, and of them, all but Beowulf fell into sleep. He alone, though lying with the rest, remained watchful. <clears throat> As he did each night, Grendel approached the hall. First, the iron barred doors asunder, and there saw a host of mighty men. Oh, <laughs> he said, a good feast tonight. He came to the first man he saw. Set upon him, and tore him limb from limb. Blood sprang under the rafters. <clears throat> Pieces of flesh flying. And he devoured him, even his hands and feet. Well, thought Grendel, that was a fine appetizer. The main course is next. And he reached down to the biggest, mightiest of the men. Oh, this must be their captain. I'll have fun with this one. And reached down to the hold of his arm. And felt a hand grasp his arm in return. 
Now Beowulf had in his hands the strength of thirty mighty men. And as he laid his hands upon Grendel's wrist, the monster felt fear for the first time. This was no ordinary man. This was no simple piece of food in this hall. And he thought it must escape. But Bill stood and began to grapple. And as they fought, the hall was shook. Mead benches were cast aside, tables knocked over. And the very rafters of the hall were shaken, and were not such a mighty building as it was. It would surely have come crashing down. The geats were awakened, fell upon the monster with their swords. But Grendel was expelled, so that no blade could harm him. But still, Beowulf's strength made him fear. And as they grappled, as Grendel hoped and tried to get away, a wound opened in his shoulder. It got wider and wider. Tendons popped, bones snapped, and his arm was torn completely from his body. Screeching with pain, the monster ran off out of the hall and back to the mirror, where he sank beneath the waters and died. In the morning, the Danish people came back to the hall, saw Beowulf and most of his companions live and whole, saw the blood on the walls, saw the furniture scattered, and knew a great battle had taken place. Then Hrothgar, king of the Danes, praised Beowulf and thanked him. Many rich gifts were brought to Beowulf and his companions, fine harness of armor, boar proud helms, great swords, a golden standard, horses, shields, everything they could have imagined or asked, everything it was in Hrothgar's power to give them, for they had saved his people. Wealthiel, the queen, too, passed the mead cup around first to her lord and then to Beowulf and his company as the heroes of the day. And the bard struck up the harp and sang a new song of Beowulf's praise of his past exploits and the slaying of Grendel. <clears throat> and so after a day and a night and another day of feasting and stories and songs, Geats and Danes together, exhausted from their celebrations, lay down to sleep. So let's begin with questions, and if there are no, I'm just saying. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. And if there are other things that I can elaborate on, I'll have to do that as well. <coughs> sure, okay. Um, this is an Anglo Saxon lyre, or harpa, it's called in Old English. Uh, this was built by Master Alan Mickington. Uh, he's from Pragmere, which is in Thierry, where I live. And uh, his wife, Anicia, painted the wolf's heads, which are my badge, on it. Uh, the strap, like I mentioned earlier, was my wife's weaving, uh, in the colors of our Shire Lions Um his work, he bases it largely on um, period examples of the Trosignan Lyre and the Sutton Hoo Lyre. The Trosignan was relatively, that's a, relatively intact. Uh, relatively is a, is a pretty broad term for, for lyre. They don't really survive well. Um, as you can see, it's quite light. Um, feel free to pass it around. Um, Talk about it, your use of sure. it during the... Sure, okay. That's and uh, what I do with it, um, I've seen a number of different performances with lyre. It's definitely an accompaniment instrument. It, you can do a little bit of melodic work with it, and I have, but um, you only have six fixed strings. So you tune it, and then you play. <laughs> and then you tune it again for it to play something different if you need different notes. Um, it, the idea was that you'd pass it around and anyone should be able to play something on it. Um, what I use it as is a sound effects machine, basically. Uh, so um, I try to evoke what I'm getting across in my story with, uh, with the lyre. So that's the when Grendel's approaching. Um, obviously, John Liam's Jaws theme is not a period piece, uh, but 
I'm also aware that as a bard, I need to engage my audience. And my audience doesn't live in the 10th century, even though we try to <laughs> every couple of weekends. Um, and so I thought, now, how do I get across to a modern audience, postmodern audience, indeed, what this is going to be? And that was what came to mind. And that I feel um, good about the authenticity of that, about the accuracy of that, because it, it evokes the same feelings in you, my audience, that something different would have evoked in a 10th or 12th century audience. So did they, did, do you have documentation or, or, or talk to me about reference yeah. or um, use We don't know exactly. Mm -hmm. um, we do know that the heart was used extensively with poetry, with stories. Um, this type of this song, heart? This kind of heart, yes. Okay. Um, this is the standard Anglo-Saxon stringed instrument mm -hmm. until into the, the High Middle Ages, really. Mm -hmm. um, and there are similar Swedish and, and uh, Finnish and Danish versions and other instruments that are similar as well. Uh, I have a yoiko at home as well, which is a, a Swedish um, bowed instrument with three strings. But um, similar in, in many ways. Um, and there are lyres from different places as well. Mm -hmm. um, in Beowulf alone, there are at least a half dozen spots where it talks about the poet and the harp, <laughs> you know, always. Mm -hmm. And it sounds the way it's described, like it is the person doing the speaking who it is playing. It could be someone else, but it sounds like that. There's also um, illumination from, I'll say the 11th century, um, of uh, people playing the harp. There's Anglo-Saxon illumination of King David Right, playing his harp or his lyre, and that's the kind of lyre that he's playing, and the way he's holding it, and the way he's strumming it, are what I was trying to evoke there. And what, you were talking about sound effects. Mm -hmm. Did they talk about melodic versus sound effect? They don't, but um, just in playing the instrument, there are so few things you can do melodically with it because you have such a limited range. Right. Um, I have actually, with other pieces that I've done, um, done a more melodic accompaniment musical part while I was singing. But um, that was something that I composed for that instrument, for that piece. Mm -hmm. um, and you can do some of that with fairly simple tunes. Uh, I could play, play Bow Wow Black Sheep, for instance. My kids like, like that one. Um, uh, with the right tuning, I could play Stairway to Heaven, actually. But um, again, the, the actual range of notes is fairly limited. And, and if you can tune it right, then you can. But um, I tend to use. Um, one of a couple of tunings, I will either, on the, the second string from, from the lowest string there, uh, the second string up, I will tend to put on the root, and then second, third, fourth, fifth, and then a bass, uh, an octave down on the sixth is one that I do. Uh, and I also, this one I just did, uh, I just went an octave down on the seventh for this tuning. So it's, the bottom string is a B, then a C, D, E, F, G. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's the high one. And so, so. In, during your performance, you clearly had periods where you were using heart pretty extensively, yeah. and then periods where you sort of stepped yes. away from it. How did you decide which were going to be what, and and did you have in mind sort of a percentage of your piece that you wanted to be playing it I for? Or? I kind of did. I didn't have a really clear one. Um, I have altered that and varied that in, in practice, because um, I certainly practiced the heart, particularly with the poetic part. Um, uh, and what I've found is if I have particularly evocative stuff, like a little trumpet sound, mm -hmm. right, the heroic bits, um, then throwing that in or doing that along with it or uh, the um, sort of arpeggio cadence that I was doing with some of the recitation, um, that could be a, a good support that was worth using. Um, I found sometimes it actually got in the way of my voice, it either distracted me or mm -hmm. it um, competed um, in terms of volume. And so I wanted to make sure that it was helping and not hindering the rest of my performance. Uh, I don't know whether they would have been playing the whole time or just for parts. Um, I know one of the people who does this sort of thing uh, fairly extensively is Benjamin Bagby of uh, Sequentia. Uh, I don't actually like his recitation style. Uh, I think um, he makes funny faces and sounds kind of strange. But um, I'm not saying it's inaccurate either. I just it, it doesn't work for me, right? I, I, it's his scholarship, bang on, I'm sure. But um, it, it, as a performer, it doesn't, it doesn't really grab me. Uh, he will do things where he'll be coming a little more melodically than I was doing, but he will accompany himself. Um, I think he probably is about seventy-five percent of the time. Um, there's a couple of, of reasons I tried not to do. As I said, um, didn't want to get in the way of the story part. 
Uh, also, I have a day job, and so my time to um, be able to work that up and, and be in practice of that is within postmodern constraints. Um, mm -hmm. I think um, having that freedom to play more and that, that being the thing you would do because a scald in period, uh, particularly my period of the 10th century, wouldn't have to do other work, but they'd be supported because of their craft. And so um, having you know full days to do that, I would probably do more. Mm -hmm. um, at this point, uh, with my level of skill on the, on the wire, this was what I felt I was able to do in an effective way. Let's talk about your Anglo-Saxon, which sounds beautiful. Oh, thank you. Yes. Um, it seemed pretty effortless. Yeah. I first studied Anglo-Saxon at university uh, in, I want to say, 1998. Mm -hmm. So I've been speaking it and worked with this text for quite a while. Um, I have been trying to memorize chunks in the original, and uh, this is one of the pieces that I had pretty solidly. So I'm like, we'll build from that, like, go into the grand book story. Um, so I'm mostly, I think I, I cite um, Bruce Mitchell, uh, who's the textbook author that I've worked from, and uh, Dr. Michael Tresco at Okanagan, or UBC Okanagan, I should say, in Kelowna, um, was my professor. And so uh, I found even then that the language kind of flowed for me, and so that's been. So did you retell what you said? What you no. When you just started the story? I just, I just did it when I went on to the next, the next piece okay. of it. Yeah, I could tell you what it means if you'd like. No, but, I love okay. it. Don't do it. Land, <laughs> fade back into the Anglo-Saxon at the end. Okay. When they're giving them all this shit, don't do that in English. Do that in English. Okay. Yeah. Transition back. That was beautiful. Thank I you. love that you didn't give us, that you didn't go back and give us all that crap because it turns out it was inimical to the story. And yeah. It's beautiful to do it in Anglo-Saxon. And then I didn't care. When I, when <laughs> I, I perform, exactly when I perform this for, say, uh, a campfire audience, I do a lot less in Saxon because mm -hmm. people you know, don't necessarily have the attention span to lock into it unless they're really engaged in this sort of thing. Um, sometimes I've tried it, and sometimes it's worked, sometimes it hasn't. What I'll often do is do the first three lines, which are really the attention grabber in Anglo-Saxon, and then start into modern English, and then throw key lines in, like, that was called Kuning. Right, that was right, a good yeah. king. It's just, it's just so great. <laughs> I'll, I'll put things like that in for punctuation. I, I thought the the liar liar, right? yeah, liar. liar worked very well with, <laughs> with the sat with the sat Anglo Saxon. Yeah. It worked beautifully. But that that was really kind of a high point for me. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, really, I, know, yeah. I have a question. Sure. The, the Anglo Saxon had a, had a cadence to it. Seems like, yeah. But when you told the story, did you use the liar as? To give you the cadence, or um, a little bit. I have read a number of translations mm -hmm. of this, and as I said, my documentation. Um, it, this current storytelling theory around Anglo-Saxon story and, and poetry mm -hmm. seems to be that it was transmitted and preserved partially through memorization, partially through memorization. Um, so, how I wanted to do that was, I thought, okay, if I were in period, I would have heard you know five or six different shops. Their word for a, a bard, scald is, is Norse, um, uh, performing this right in different ways with slightly different retellings and whatever. There are parts actually that I had in my documentation which didn't end up happening in my telling. Um, there's those little details and things that I, I skipped over. Whatever, that's what happens. Um, but so I would have heard this different ways at different times. And I thought the best way in 2015 to do that is to read as many translations as I can get my hands on. So I think I've had about five that I've got, that I've, uh, well, certainly five hard copy ones and a few from the internet as well. Uh, so probably seven or eight altogether. Um, plus my own past tellings of it, plus my own um, translations of it from school, etc. And all of that has come together. So there are phrases, for instance, that um, in the English part, that are from translations or are from, I remember what the Anglo-Saxon sounds like here, so I'm gonna try to work that into, um, and the heart just to enhance that a bit, yeah. You, you touched on what, something that I really liked in your documentation, the evolution of a story. How do you keep the basic facts and then retell it for your audience? Um, well, for me, uh, and I think this follows along with like the Perry and Lord model and Mark Modio and other scholars I mentioned, um, I think broad narrative frames are the way to go. Um, there are certain things, this story has a certain arc, a certain plot arc, and there are certain things that happen. And Joseph Campbell would tell us, these are the things that happen in every story, right? There's the first challenge, which is the Coast Guard. Um, there, often there's another secondary um, challenge in there. Um, there's the fight with the monster, the descent into the key, all that sorts of things. And having those key points 
and making sure those are in uh, for me is the really key thing. And the exact words that they happen in is less important. So that's the improvised part. Uh, so uh, as long as I have the right framework, it works. So for example, um, in fairy tales, we're all, we often get three protagonists who try to do something three times, each with varied degrees of success, um, and have stock phrases like, you know, not by the hair of my chinny chin chin, or, or I'll huff and I'll huff and I'll blow their house down, or whatever it <coughs> happens to be, and finally succeed, often by working together, or the third attempt is the greatest, or the third person trying it is the strongest, or whatever. Um, so we have stories like Three Billy Goats Gruff and Three Little Pigs. Um, three Bears is actually inverted so that they're the victims of the, you know, demented housebreaking little blonde girl. But, uh, <laughs> um, but those, those stories, like, those three, uh, three Little Goats Gruff, um, Three Little Pigs, those sorts of stories are essentially the same story. Really the same thing is happening there. The details of species and of exactly what's happening and oh they have houses, no trying to cross the bridge. Those things are different. They have a challenge to overcome, whether it's the, the troll under the bridge or the wolf knocking down their houses. And um, so in, in they, those things pr persevere and are preserved. And what exactly, how that's told is less important. Um, I've done papers before on sort of uh, storytelling as a teaching instrument in the Middle Ages. And the same lesson comes through regardless. And so the little details are less important. It's yeah, it's very freeing for a storyteller. It really is. It gives it less, a lot less memorization and more freedom for, yeah, yeah, for creativity. Absolutely. Yeah. It is more work, too, I found. I initially conceived of this as a, uh, a recitation of the first 52 lines in an Anglo Saxon with the lyre, which would have been really cool. Um, but I realized it would have been very academic as well. I wouldn't have had the same audience engagement as I can achieve with this. And I that's, know, it good. it's not the bard I want to be, right? <laughs> I, 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 I'm really good at the academic stuff, and I enjoy it. But I want to be able to appeal to an audience as well. And so. <laughs> so just a, not a question, but a comment. Sure. So um, as was mentioned, the Anglo-Saxon at the beginning has this very yeah. lyrical flow to mm -hmm. it as you're speaking, partially because you've memorized it and yeah. memorized English. When you're using the harp, your English develops that same lyrical flow. Oh, okay. So I actually was hoping that you would use the wire more, because every time you started using the wire, it turns out you would yeah. slow your words down a little bit, and you started to develop that rhythm that you had with the Anglo-Saxon that was missing with some of your I can hear what you're saying, so thinking back over my... Uh -huh. my so, yeah. so even the very simple, just a single note on the wire over and over again, as mm -hmm. you were talking about Wendell, put your oh, words you. into this okay. pattern. So if you can increase the sure, amount that you're doing that, I think that would actually bring some more of the continuity of, from the Anglo-Saxon into that. Mm -hmm. into that Thank you. I'll, I'll, so, I'll do that. Yeah. She's very smart. Oh, yeah. She's <laughs> bardic here. Yeah. Yes, I don't yeah. know. No. <laughs> so, yeah. Other people can ask questions. questions. We don't have to be the only yeah. people. Please feel free to... Yeah. I'm happy to share my documentation too if anyone wants to get a copy of it. Yeah, oh, it's really good. Get email addresses yeah. and send it to you. <laughs> Are there any other questions, or mm -hmm. this the wire, or anything? So please stare what happened on the wire. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm From uh, Baron James Wolfton from my. Nice. Um, so here's the other thing that actually I, I really liked in your recitation, and, and could even that, I know. We're in time. Okay. Um, so, <coughs> I'll just say it real quick. So, you know, right, Peter, classic Peter and Wolf, there's a little thing that yep. plays every time that Peter's around. Yeah, there's a little that's thing that's that plays when they're in the Wolf's story. Right? With Grendel, you almost had that. You had this, you know, sort of low note yeah. clock that happened every time Grendel's around. Pick something like that for um, Beowulf, too. So that every time Beowulf's doing something, you oh, put yeah. that other note yeah. in some mm -hmm. other sort of slightly okay. different pattern. Because that was really cool. I felt it really brought the liar to the too. Anyways, okay, I'll stop talking. No, 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 that's exactly. <laughs> that was great. See, I didn't yeah. hear, I heard Grendel, I didn't hear Jaws. Okay. Looking right. back, that's funny. I heard Jaws. But I, I was totally yeah. good with it. <laughs> okay. Thank you.